Welcome, everyone. My name is Kristen Zenka. I'm a director in executive education at MIT Sloan and a lecturer in work and organization studies. I focus my teaching on helping leaders use coaching skills to be better leaders. And I am delighted to be here today with my friend and colleague, Tara Swart. Dr. Tara Swart is a senior lecturer at MIT. She's a neuroscientist and she's the author of The Source. The source blends science and spirituality to help you maximize your brain power. Tara also teaches with us. She teaches courses in exec ed called Applied Neuroscience, Neuroscience for Leadership. And we have a new program coming out called Neuroscience for Business. So today we're gonna to talk about the source, maximizing our brain power. And I'd like to start by recognizing that, you know, we're in an unprecedented time. Tara, you know, please, uh, before I keep going, if you have questions, we are going to be pausing and taking questions throughout. So please enter your questions in the comments section. We'd like to make this as conversational as possible and address your questions when they come up. So my first question for Tara is, you know, what principles from the source have helped you or helped your clients during this unprecedented time of the pandemic? Welcome, Tara. Thanks, Kristen. That's such a good question. And, and before I answer it, I really want to reiterate what you've just said, which is this platform is an opportunity for us to be really interactive in a way that, um, you know, we're not, not always able to on, on platforms. And also because, you know, I haven't been on campus in Massachusetts for a year now, so I haven't had the opportunity to meet many of you that I would have, um, and I'm really missing that. So. I think probably the top thing that I have personally really recognized, even though I know the theory of it, is how important that sense of belonging and be, being around people and interacting with people and you know getting that sort of brain stimulation really is. Um, and then I think I think you really hit the nail on the head, Kristen, by saying it, you know, it blends science and spirituality because I think if I only focused on what I know from neuroscience or psychiatry, I don't think I could have got through the last year in the way that I did. And equally, I think if I just spent the whole time meditating and journaling and not known kind of what was going on in terms of my brain chemistry and you know physiologically in my body, I don't think I would have got through it as well either. And I'm by no means saying that I've got through it really well. Um, I think it's just been so difficult for everyone in different ways. Um, and when I did the Innovation at Work webinar last March, I described the Kubler-Ross change curve, which gives us an idea of the emotional roller coaster that we go on and that we will have been on like so many times in the last year. And another big thing that came up for me was that even if you're confined with a small number of people who you're super close to, you're not going through that change curve at the same rate. So one of you could be in denial whilst one of you is kind of really shocked. One of you could be angry whilst the other one's depressed and it just makes everything worse. So I really think it's massively about awareness. And to me, the biggest thing was listening to my body. So with the stress hormone, everything changed, like your appetite, your weight, your motivation, your sleep patterns. For women, menstrual cycles massively changed in the last year. So, you know, even things like normally I only eat between 12 noon and 8 p.m. But it got to the point where if I was hungry in the morning, I would eat because I would just think like, we're trying to survive right now. It's not about superior brain performance. Um, I know that you have read the source and that you are the program director for all of my programs. So I'd love to know what, what you picked up from the source that helped you in the last year as well. Um, what really helps me are some of the visualizations and um, relaxing my brain is really difficult. Uh, because, you know, between managing everything at home, everything at work, with my family, um, I feel like my brain is always in that survival mode. So I think doing one of the creative visualizations and taking time to do some deep breathing, you know, helps get me out of that reactive mode. Yeah, I'm just seeing... I love the fact that everyone's writing where they're from because it's just so beautiful to see literally like Brazil, Nepal, Sweden, Belize. Um, 
Guatemala City, just like so many places. But I think that, you know, when you said, I realized that my brain is in survival mode, I think that's kind of, that's got to be a given. There's nothing wrong with saying that or knowing that all of our brains are in survival mode. We've not in living memory been through anything like this. And we're actually super good at dealing with acute stress. That's what we're built for. That's why we have a stress response. You know, it's, but the adrenaline and the cortisol can really help us when we need to meet a challenge. But when the stress just goes on and on, and, you know, it's kind of always there in the background and you still have to homeschool and you still have to work and you still have to have some kind of balance, it takes a real shift in mindset to think about, okay, how do I run a marathon when I'm actually a sprinter? It is. I mean, it's also a time of reflection because all of the noise of our daily lives and running to get everywhere and to get to work and to commute and just get the daily things done, a lot of that noise is, is gone. So I've also found that it's a time to think about what are the things that I want to hold on to and what's really important to me for the future? And then how can I manifest that and make it happen? Which takes me to, um, you know, in your book, you talk about the laws of attraction. Mm -hmm. You know, how are they backed by science? Well, I love that you've asked it like that, because I think when I came up with the idea of the book and, you know, obviously people like you and the team at, at MIT Sloan, knew what I was going to write before it came out and then it came out and I did actually get asked on the podcast you know you're a professor at MIT do you not think it was a bit of a risk to your career to write about the laws of attraction um and I really hadn't thought about it because I've had just such unconditional support from MIT obviously but when I first started doing the research I'd always thought if if it's the power of your mind and the power of your thoughts that can help you to change your life it should be explained by cognitive science rather than, for example, quantum science or vibrations and frequencies as it's previously been described. Still works, but in you know the mind of a scientist, I needed to understand it differently. And so I was really taken by the fact that it was, there was so much obvious, you know, so in my area of research, neuroplasticity, um, there was so much obvious science to back up things like abundant thinking manifesting the things that you want in life um you know having a strong desire for something and how that changes you know whether it's an intrinsic or an extrinsic desire how that changes how successful you are in getting what you really want um and then things like visualizations and what i call action boards because mit's motto is mens et manus which means mind and hand and i always said manifestation cannot be about creating some fantasy and then sitting at home and just waiting for it to come true. It must be that you are doing something every day, even if it's just a visualization, even if it's networking, even if it's you know writing down a list of your goals or writing down things that you have achieved that you just tend to skim over, then it's your responsibility to be moving yourself forward all the time. So it really is about you using your hand as well as your mind and, and that's, that's what I love about the blend between spirituality and science, because I think it really like really speaks to that motto of, of MIT. You talked about action boards. You know, how do you, and you talk about it in your book, and I've seen some action boards that have been created. I got a couple notes that I'm, I'm difficult to hear. So I'm leaning closer to the computer and, and hoping yes. you can hear me more, more clearly. Yeah, it's um, better. Okay. Um, you know, how does one start creating an action board? How do you know what to put on your action board? How do you go about getting to that place where you're ready to move forward and start manifesting? Yeah, so I actually, I want to answer that question in the context of this year that we've just had. And so I have been very targeted with action boards for the last 12 years. And an action board is literally a collage that you make by hand. I wish I could flip my camera around and show you my table. It's covered in images that I've cut out from magazines. Um, you can do it digitally on Pinterest or Corculus as well, but you collect sets of metaphorical or literal images that represent how, you know, what you want in your life, how you want your career to be. Um, and 
and you place them strategically on a board to, you know, like the important things are at the top or center or whatever, like feels right to you. And if you want some space in your life, then you leave some space on the board. If you want your life to be full, then you put everything right up against each other. And so, but what I want to say about this year is that it's been so hard because we don't know what we're going to be allowed to do or what's going to happen next to um, really create a, a, a targeted board. And so what I've said this year is, um, make the imagery how you want your life to feel, not specific things that you want in your life. Because lots of people have said to me, my career, you know, my career choice is now defunct. I can't do the job that I was doing before. Or even the thing that I really wanted to do, I now can't do because it's not going to be possible in the next year or the near future. So I have definitely sought, sourced images that are much more to do with a feeling of creativity or freedom or flexibility. And, and actually that really comes back to the source because the source is about brain agility. It's about using your intuition and your emotional intelligence and your creativity um, to make the most of your brain power and not just keep going down the channels that you usually do, which may be more like logic or motivation. So how does, you know, especially during this time where we're, many of us are stressed, how do you create agility in your brain? You talk a lot about brain agility in your book and, um, how do you develop it? Yeah, so it's quite a hard thing to do in a year when we're under chronic stress, to be honest. But but basically, I write in the book about six ways of thinking, which are um, emotional mastery. So n understanding your emotions, being able to regulate them, being intelligent and compassionate with your emotions. Knowing yourself, which is the brain-body connection. So listening to those messages from your body, like I mentioned, like, I'm hungrier than usual, or I'm tired at a different time than I used to be, or you know, my back's aching because I'm sitting at my desk all day and I'm much more sedentary than I used to be. Then there is logic, which you know, I think anybody who um, is signed up to this, this LinkedIn Live is probably very good at using their logic, but you know, we've needed to use that a lot in the last year. Then there's resilience and motivation. Probably these came to the fore in the last year. And then there's also creativity. And so usually I ask people to take a snapshot of which ones do you like doing, feel comfortable thinking that way and, you know, sort of use a lot in your normal work and life. And how could you bring in little elements of more empathy or more intuition or more creativity into what you do? Um, I would give people permission in the past year and the foreseeable few months to rely on your strengths more than ever because that's more energy efficient for your brain. So when you are trying to learn a new way of being or experiment with different ways of thinking, it uses up a lot more of your brain resources. And um, so basically your brain uses glucose and oxygen to think. And it's like you wake up with a bucket of cognitive resources that's full in the morning. And every time you make a decision or interact with someone or you know work towards a deadline, you're, you're using up what's in that bucket. When you're chronically stressed, it's like there's a leak in the bucket and it's just slowly draining away, even if you're not particularly using your brain power. So to override your natural preferences and use different ways of thinking, I would say is too difficult at the moment. So unless you feel that you have so much bandwidth that you can do that, I try to identify what, you know, things you might like to change in future but probably really rely on your strengths for now. Um, what are some of the things you can do right now? Um, like I know one thing you encouraged me to do is to, when I was going through some stress is keep it simple, focusing on do, focus on doing a few things really well. Mm -hmm. um, how do you keep it simple? What are the, some of the things that we can do to help our, help our bodies, to nourish ourselves? Um, right now and how would you prioritize it i really like that you specifically said help our bodies and nourish ourselves because i would definitely bring it back to the physical those are the easiest things for us to control so although i like to think of health and well-being and even you know brain performance as physical mental emotional and spiritual 
The ones that you can really take responsibility over and do something about are the physical ones. And they fall under the categories of rest, fuel, hydrate, oxygenate, and simplify. Um, and I would pay attention to micro tweaks in each of those areas rather than one really big thing like, oh, I've been sedentary for so long, I'm suddenly going to start exercising three times a week or five times a week or whatever it is. So what I have been doing myself is just, well, the advice I give usually is go to bed half an hour earlier, but what I've been doing is focusing on going to bed and waking up at the same time every day because we know that that has an additional benefit to getting eight hours sleep. I've been in the practice of getting eight hours sleep for so long that I get the eight, but it's not always at the same sleep time and wake time. So I've been focusing on that. Um, but if you're not getting eight hours sleep, then increasing your you know sleep time by half an hour is the first thing. Um, Fuel. So again, you know, normally I say eating, you know, in a brain friendly way three times a day with healthy snacks is like base one. And then if you're already sleeping well, eating well, exercising, you can think about time restricted eating like what I was doing 12 noon till 8 p.m. And if you if you really want to take it to the next level, then you can also do um, intermittent fasting, which is reducing your calorie intake on two non consecutive days of the week. But for the last year, I would say that no one should be doing intermittent fasting because it's the whole way that it works is that it stresses out your body um, and then you build your resilience by going through bits of stress. Well, we don't need any more stress at the moment. Like I said, I've even stopped the um, time restricted eating. So what I do now is I try to make sure that I get as many brain friendly foods into my day as possible. And that's the oily fish like salmon and mackerel, nuts, seeds, olive oil, uh, olives and olive oil, eggs, um, leafy greens, hydrating fruits and vegetables, and particularly for your brain, dark foods. So eggplant, purple sprouting broccoli, black beans, um, blueberries or blackberries, um, dark chocolate and organic coffee count in that list. So it's always nice to know there's something that is a treat, but also good for your brain. The other thing I found really interestingly is that executive coaching clients I'd worked with before and really got them into a good habit of having a water bottle and refilling it in the office. We're sitting at home at our desks and forgetting to drink enough water. So that's something I've actually seen go backwards. Um, and the thing about the stress hormone cortisol is it dries out your whole system. So you might notice some internal dryness like constipation, or you might notice a lot of external dryness like dry skin or an itchy scalp or dry hair. And so making sure that you're increasing your water intake, you are you know, minimizing caffeine and alcohol, that you're eating hydrating foods because you actually get more hydration from foods than water, like um, cucumber, salads, melon. Um, and yeah, just eating regularly because your brain really needs to stay resourced. And so you know, choosing things like nuts and seeds as your snack so that it's still healthy. Um, and then oxygenation is two things. One is that people have found themselves more sedentary. So it's, you know, I'm wearing my aura ring again to track my steps and my activity and my calorie burn um, and just making little tweaks based on that. So, you know, it reminds you if you haven't, you know, stood up and walked around at least every hour and it tells you how you're progressing during the day. Um, but the other part is breathing. So when we had to escape from tread predators in cave times, which was our brilliant response to acute stress, we would breathe in a rapid shallow way because um, that's what you do when you're exerting yourself. And way before the pandemic, I had loads of executive clients who would like hold their breath or breathe in a really shallow way. But that's got worse in the last year. And so just remembering to take 10 deep breaths or when you do your meditation, if you don't know how to do it, just focusing on your breath is really important. And so for both the oxygen reason and just for mental health reasons, getting outside and being in nature and just seeing a bigger picture and a bigger vista and something different is really important too. And then of course, there's formal meditation, which is the only thing you can do in like 12 minutes a day that has such an amazing impact on your brain. So I would work along those sorts of ideas and just pick five, to 10 small things that you can tweak, you know, over a matter of weeks or months and really try to build them into your habits for the day. Thank you.
usually when Tara is here for her courses, we give people the opportunity to experience um, yoga. So that's certainly something I'm missing about being on campus. But with meditation, um, we do some medica- meditations in the courses. If someone's never meditated before, you said to focus on your breath. Um, what are some ways that people can can start meditating if it's something that they've never tried? Well, the easiest way to start if you've never tried is to use one of these apps. So there are apps like Headspace, Calm, Budify, and, and many, many more. Um, Unplug. So find one that you like, you know, if you like the voice of the person that helps, just put your your earphones in and um, listen to the voice for 10 minutes and just kind of, you know, let them guide you. It took me nine or 10 months of doing that before I could do it without the app. So, you know, it does take some time. But then if you don't want to use an app, because let's say you're choosing not to use technology, then do something like, um, like I said, focusing on your breath as one and maybe just counting how long your breaths are and trying to make the inhale and the exhale pretty equal. Um, Otherwise you can do open monitoring of your thoughts, which is just sit quietly for 10 minutes and just see what thoughts come into your mind and just let them come and go. Um, You can also do um, intentional mind wandering. So you can just sit down and ask yourself a what if question and then just let your mind go in all different directions. Um, Or you can do focused attention, which is, picking a sound or an object and just focusing on that. Um, The thing I'm really into at the moment is Vedic meditation, which is use of a mantra. And, you know, there's evidence that a lot of very successful executives use Vedic meditation or transcendental meditation. um, And that's like the most effective for mental health and brain performance. But personally, I don't, I think, you know, mindfulness is an umbrella term and meditation is one of the things that falls under that, like yoga. One of the things I've really cultivated in this last year, and you know, like you said, there's time for introspection, also we're just stuck at home most of the time, is creating a patchwork quilt of mindfulness throughout my whole day. So I do my Vedic meditation first thing in the morning when I wake up like in bed, but then throughout the day I do mindful eating. If I go outside, I do mindful walking. Um, I do do yoga as well, and then, when it's kind of meal times or just, you know, wind down time in the evening, I'm very, and throughout the day, actually, I'm really, really conscious of paying attention to my loved ones. So even if I'm in the middle of a really important email and my husband walks in, whereas before I would have been like, oh, you know, I'm in the middle of something and he's interrupting me. I always say to myself now, okay, what is the most important thing? Is this email more important than your marriage? So I stop in the middle of the email and I turn and I pay my full attention and I'm not holding my phone at the same time and I'm not thinking about other things at the same time. So with that, you find that you're actually doing a lot of mindfulness through the day. And it's just a matter of building those things up and kind of, you know, being very aware that that's your intention is to be mindful. So adding simple ways that you can draw more attention to what you're doing and build it into your day, build more things over time. Exactly. Yes. Um, so when you're talking about building new, in a sense, it's, um, we have a question. Ooh, exciting. I'll have my next question. Um, how can we try mindfulness practices while working from home? This is a great question. So I think um, a kind of rehash of the things that we've said. So, you know, a lot of people, I used to do my mindfulness on my commute. I used to do it on the London Underground. So that got taken away. And a lot of people have said, you know, I used to use my commute to do, you know, certain things. So now I use, um, you know, whatever formal meditation I'm doing and exercise as ways to signal the beginning and end of my work day. So like I said, I do my meditation first thing in the morning because I've just found that if I don't do that, then I get, you know, busy and distracted and I end up not doing it. So I do that first thing in the morning. You can always do some deep breaths between Zoom meetings, even if you're sat at your desk all day. You can do a bit of desk side yoga, um, where you preferably you would stand up, but you know if you if you don't even have time to do that, you can just do some stretching at your desk, particularly your neck and shoulders and and your arms. You can do um, there's something really nice about like having a beautiful mug or cup. And, you know, making your tea or your matcha or your coffee or your turmeric latte or whatever and really savoring it between 
meetings rather than grabbing a coffee and sort of, you know, drinking it whilst you're in the next meeting. Um, the apps I mentioned, you know, if you have 10 or 12 minutes, you can use them in between. Um, and actually, really, you know, if it's if there's a lunch break, taking a proper lunch break and, you know, sitting down with your family and eating together and not having your devices, they're all these ways of building mindfulness into your day at home. Thank you. So you're talking about building some new habits, you know, through time, essentially, mm -hmm. and maybe new pathways. Um, yeah, maybe. You talk a lot about neuroplasticity uh, in your courses and in the book. Um, how does someone build neuroplasticity in the brain? And then how does someone attempt to do that in these times? What are the best ways? And Well, I mean, in a way, what we've been through in the year is, a, is an opportunity to build neuroplasticity. I mean, I know there was a sort of argument online kind of last March or April, which was that there were a lot of people saying, okay, I'm going to have a few months off and I'm going to start up a new business or I'm going to like, you know, learn a new language. And some people were very angry about this because it, you know, put a lot of pressure on people to, to do new things and not just do the minimum or not just kind of, you know, do what they had to to survive. And, and I, I was very much in that camp. I said, this is not the time to, to learn something new or try to like, you know, change your brain. It's the time to use the fact that hopefully you've done things to build resilience in your brain already and you're gonna use up that, you're gonna use that up now basically. Um, so for me, it happened a bit accidentally. So I kind of took up opportunities and I think for a good three months or so, I didn't do anything new. I just did what I had to and I actually dialed down and made it like, you know, I'm not gonna do more than, than what I really have to. And then it became sort of spring, summer in the UK and my husband really wanted to play tennis and he's much better than me. So we decided we would buy one of these tennis ball machines that throws the ball at you so that he could he could play um, by himself. And I left it too late, so they'd all been sold out. So I sort of reluctantly said, we, I'll, you know, I'll come to the court with you, but you're gonna have to give me lessons because I'm just no way as good as you. And then I experienced that absolute rush of neuroplasticity, just seeing yourself getting better at something each time. And, you know, sort of seeing that progress and I could, it was because it was physical, it felt more like neuroplasticity and progress than like when I learned language or, and I have to say my cooking has massively improved in the last year as well. Not in it's, you know, not out of choice. I've cooked three meals a day for most of a year. Um, so I think seeing those little opportunities of where you've made changes and what you have become better at and focusing on that rather than necessarily thinking, you know, I'm going to take on some new learning. But like I always say, a new language or a musical instrument are the best things. And I've had a piano keyboard. I'm ashamed to say it was my Christmas present the year before last, and it's been gathering dust. And so I was saying on sort of social media and stuff that I'd love to, to learn it, but obviously now I can't get a teacher, you know, in your home or whatever. And then somebody told me about this app called Floki, and it's completely changed my life. It's amazing. Um, so you just use the app on your phone. It tells you what to do on the piano. It listens back to what you play. And, you know, that's been really wonderful too. But I think the message here is that it's so important to go with what you actually want to do that's enjoyable rather than forcing yourself to try to create neuroplasticity in your brain because actually then it just has the opposite effect. Let's see. So how to get started from Amit, how to create the urge to follow the discipline in such a busy and fast moving life. Many times we try to start and then we might give up because we don't feel motivated or the urge. And, you know, we all have so much going on right now and everybody's dealing with their, their different cha challenges. So how totally. um, I think the answer is kind of in what I said earlier, which is the main reason that people um, you know, make resolutions and then fail at them is because the resolution was too big in the first place. And then it's either like that you either do the exercise three times a week or you failed. But if you make it a smaller thing, like I'm going to do exercise once a week until that is so easy and natural that I can start doing twice a week. And then you build it up like that. That's a better way to fit things into a busy lifestyle. I also don't do New Year's resolutions anymore. I do quarterly resolutions and I do two or three small things. And I find that at the end of three months, 
if they were small enough, they've become a natural habit. And then at the end of a year, I look back and there's 12, you know, 10 or 12 new things that I'm doing. Um, and they were things that I struggled with in the past because I just tried to do too many of them at a time. So, you know, it would be like improve your diet and exercise more and, you know, sort of do more meditation and spend more time with people. And it was all too much. So as soon as I broke it down into bite sized chunks, that's what the brain likes. Um, and that's actually really rewarding. I'm starting small and I, a week ago I started a sourdough bread, a bread starter. So every day I feed my starter and I'm, I, you know, until the pandemic, I really, um, I'm not a cook, I'm learning to cook. But for me, I feel a little rush of calm and excitement every time I follow up on that one simple thing in the morning. So, so <laughs> it's very nurturing. Um, yeah. Even though we know that screen time isn't the best way to relax, I still love watching a movie so do I. Um, yes. <laughs> and how can you get into that relaxed state before sleeping and relax your brain? That's a really good question. Thank you. So I always say that proper sleep hygiene starts first thing in the morning. Um, and so, you know, we've, yeah, in the past year, another thing that we've changed is we have um, no devices in the bedroom. I didn't have mine in the bedroom anyway, but my husband used his phone as the alarm clock and I'd managed to persuade him to, I bought him an alarm clock. So now we have no devices. So you wake up to an alarm clock rather than a phone. So you can't start immediately scrolling on your phone because you don't have it. Um, I never drink caffeine after 10 a.m. The quarter life of caffeine is 12 hours. So 12 hours after your last caffeinated drink, a quarter of the caffeine is still buzzing around your brain. Um, and then, you know, I try to be physically active enough during the day. And like I said before, the guidelines were 10,000 steps a day plus 150 minutes of aerobic exercise a week. Now, my minimum is five to 10,000 steps a day. Um, and I don't, and that's pretty much now my maximum as well. If I get, if I want to be on the Peloton or I want to do yoga or I want to go out for a walk, fine, but I'm just making sure that I'm not too sedentary. I'm not pushing myself to do too much more than that. But if you're not, you know, if you're sedentary, you won't be able to sleep as well. Um, I love a movie or a series in the evenings too. So <clears throat> basically I stop eating two hours before bedtime because the digestion process takes up to two hours and you want that to be done before you go to bed. I apply a magnesium spray to whichever parts of my body feel tense or just a large skin area whilst I'm watching the movie so that I'm starting to, you know, that helps you to relax your muscles and your mind. Um, Although you do get blue light and some stimulation from a TV screen, it is further away from you. So it's better than having a, you know, like your phone right in your face kind of thing. Um, and you can turn down, you can change the settings on the phone so it's less blue light because that's what disrupts your sleep wake cycle. Um, I, I had already done a lot of research into bedding, but I've spoken to some bedding companies this year and they said people have spent a lot of money on their bedrooms this year. So I've made the bedroom environment so nice that I actually want to go to, um, <laughs> I want to go to bed. And then I always cuddle my husband because that gives us both a boost of oxytocin, which is that bonding hormone, which also helps you to, you know, sort of feel more warm and lower your guard. And, and if I need to, then I'll do some Vedic meditation or yoga nidra, which is a progressive relaxation of the body in bed. I just saw that Aurelie has made a bed for her phone in her living room, which is so cute. That's a bit like, like your puppy has his own little bed. What about warm baths or magnesium baths? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so absolutely. A magnesium bath both has the benefits of being immersed in warm water, which will give you an oxytocin boost if you don't have someone to cuddle. Um, and the magnesium is much better taken through your skin. And obviously, you know, if you stay in the bath for at least 15 minutes, then you get a lot of absorption of it. Um, but I just don't think it's practical for people to do that every day, which is why I use the spray. Um, but yeah, if you have, if you get like overheated at night, then it's a really good idea to have a hot bath or shower just before bed as well. Um, you see, we have a question from Joe. Is it possible to improve our cognitive flexibility and can this help us to cope with the rapid changes that are happening in the world today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, those six ways of thinking that I mentioned, emotions, physicality, intuition, logic, motivation, and creativity, 
it's about being able to switch nimbly between all of those ways of thinking. We can all do all of them, but we have some preferences. Um, and it tends to be like, there's two of them that are my main ways of thinking and I'm really you know, comfortable thinking like that um, and I'm pretty good at it. And then there's two ways that you think, okay, I don't really do that a lot, but if there was a crisis, I could do it. And then there's one or two ways of thinking that people say, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. I don't really do it. So it's about exploring those six pathways and just, like I said, focusing on your strengths, but making sure that if you needed to recruit other ways of thinking, that you could. And the analogy that I use is if you had to brick, build a low brick wall outside your house, if you had to do that by yourself, how long would it take you and how difficult would that be for you? If you could ask three or four friends to come and help you, how much quicker and easier would it be? That's the same way to think about cognitive flexibility. I see a question that's come up in the chat and it's considering that we're mostly working from home, you know, how do we avoid losing focus and working too many hours due to procrastination? <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the answer to that goes back to what I said about listening to my body and, you know, add in like being kind to yourself. Cause I've definitely had my ups and downs with motivation in the last year. And when you're in a down, it do does feel like it will last forever and you're walking through treacle and, you know, that's it. <laughs> you're done for your focus and concentration and motivation forever. The stress has killed your brain cells. But I think just understanding that this happens in cycles and it happens in cycles for all sorts of reasons, like how long or short the days are, um, you know, whether the sun shines or not, um, for hormonal reasons for you know, other things that might be going on in your life that might be draining you. And just knowing that you know, it, there is light at the end of the tunnel, you'll have a super productive spurt at some point. And you know, I, always, I do you know, sometimes procrastinate and leave things till the last minute. And then I think oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. So I think we also build up in our mind that this thing is gonna take so long and you know, be so onerous and, and it often isn't. And I've actually really learned to trust that. So now I'm like, Okay, if I'm procrastinating, I've never not done something that I had to do, so I'll just I'll just do it at the last moment and that that will have to be fine. I used to be really um unhappy with leaving things till the last moment, but I've just learned that it's okay. And you know, your first question was how have the things that I know helped me in the past year and a lot of that has been to do just with understanding myself, knowing you know, how I work best and how I don't and kind of really trying to go with that rhythm rather than forcing against it. Mm -hmm. um, I see another question from Jennifer Chase. So this is a question that my daughter actually asked Tara when she heard about her book. And what are your suggestions for bringing your ideas to children's well-being and what's most important? Yeah, a really lovely question, Jennifer. Um, so I think the mindset piece is important. I think this lack and abundance mindset thing is imprinted in children's brains from a very early age. Um, and so when everything has to be perfect in 10 out of 10, children actually cheat and lie because they don't want to ever admit that they're not perfect. But if you praise children for effort rather than talent, then they'll always want to try something, you know, the next challenge, something harder, and they won't feel shame if they don't do 10 out of 10 on that challenge. So I would say, and, and I do encourage my clients to use an app like Headspace with their children as well, because children have really suffered this year as well. So that mindfulness piece is important. Um, but I think more generally, building that mindset of, you know, there's enough out there for everyone, you know, I can explore different ways of being and, you know, really building up things like creativity, obviously, things like being proficient in math and science, you know, till as late as they can is important. But but also just helping them to understand that the way that they look at things really changes outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. So we've talked a lot about um, the different aspects of your book, The Source. Um, what's the connection with, between the programs you teach at MIT and the book, The Source? Um, so Neuroscience for Leadership, with like, which I co-teach with Professor Ancona, um, came way before the source. And so actually the, the book that I wrote before that, Neuroscience for Leadership, is the book that goes with that program. And 
So it's a mixture of what's in that book that I've written about previously and um, Deborah's amazing research as well. And then my second program, which I teach alone, the two day program, Applied Neuroscience, was a deeper dive into some topics that I really wanted to get into like um, financial risk taking and decision making, gender differences and psychopathy and AI and the future of work. Um, and we've got a much bigger expert on that in the audience in Orally, but you know, I sort of <laughs> to touch on the neuroscience angle of that. Um, and then Neuroscience for Business, which is a, the six week self-paced online program that's launching on tomorrow, I think, the 17th, yeah. Um, I'm very excited about, I filmed and created the whole thing in lockdown. So, you know, having said, oh, I was kind to myself and I let myself do the minimum. Well, after that first three months, I um, did, you know, had a very intense period working on creating neuroscience for business. And it's loosely based on the source, but obviously it's got much more of a business and leadership twist. I wrote the source for everybody. Um, so the connection is that the first section is on how neuro, what, you know, basically what is neuroscience as an amazing graphic of the unfolding of the brain in the womb, and how the brain develops through adulthood, and you know where there's a lot of potential for change, how all of that applies to business and leadership. Then there's a big section on neuroplasticity. That's my favorite section in the program, module two. Then there's six units on all of that brain agility that we just talked about, emotion, creativity, intuition, et cetera. And then I've really brought that together. You know, In neuroscience for business, we don't talk so much about abundance and manifestation, but we talk about trust, purpose, leadership vision, and the legacy that you would like to leave. Um, and there's also a six week physical exercise program that goes alongside the six weeks of the teaching. Um, my new meditation app Spark Up is part of it. So you get sent links to different parts of the meditation app as you go through the program. And um, there's, there's journaling each week as part of it as well. And we had two special yoga videos recorded specifically for that program. Obviously, since we've you know, been teaching online, I have been using those videos in neuroscience for leadership and applied neuroscience too. But it's what I, what I wanted from the source because you know it's got four completely practical chapters at the end, and from my programs, is that you wouldn't just come and learn about neuroscience, but you would go away feeling like a different person because you've eaten differently, you've exercised differently, you've you know, you've looked at your sleep and caffeine usage and things like that. So with Neuroscience for Business, I'm, and the orientation module starts tomorrow, but there's still a week to sign up if you'd like to. Um, I literally said, you know, I poured my heart and soul into this. And if you, you know, complete all, this, all the parts of this program, then you will end up six weeks later, smarter, stronger, and fitter for the future. And that's what we all need right now. How can we tie this into the law of attraction? Um, so I write about the law of attraction in the source and the, the they're actually the laws of attraction have, um, sure, the laws of attraction have um, several pillars to them, which are, which isn't always in agreement. So when I did my research, I distilled it into six pillars and I put the science behind them. And so I started with abundance because it's a very old evolutionary wiring of our brain for survival to think negatively more than positively. We're two and a half times as likely to focus on an equivalent loss than we are on gaining an equivalent reward. So the classic behavioral economics example is if you drop $20 on the street, you'd be beat yourself up about it all day and still be thinking about it when you're lying in bed at night. If you found $20 on the street, you'd be pleased for a short moment, you might keep it, you might give it to a homeless person, but you wouldn't be thinking about it for the rest of the day. So overriding that really old way of thinking that certainly helped us to survive as, survive as a species, but doesn't really serve us in the modern world, you know, within reason, you've got to assess risk, but, you know, taking healthy risks, believing that there are enough resources out there for everyone, believing that things are possible, even if that little voice in your hair set, tells you it's not, that's the start because, you know, I mean, there's this old Henry Ford quote in the book, which is, if you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're probably right. And you know, that kind of says it all. So it's got to start with believing that you can achieve more than you may have thought you could. And neuroplasticity 
shows us that that is possible. Our brains are not fixed by the time we stop physically growing. Um, and then with that positive, you know, abundant mindset, you can start to materialize into real life things that you have always wanted in your life, and that's manifestation. Underlying that is magnetic desire, which is that this must come from a deep emotion and motivation and not from some idea of what your life should be like or what sort of job you should have or what kind of person you should be married to. Um, and then the last parts are about harmony, patience, and universal connection. The patience piece is that it takes some time to coat our neural pathways with an insulating layer that makes conductance along them faster. It takes time to make synaptic connections between neurons and create thicker or strengthen brain pathways. It takes time to grow embryonic nerve cells into fully grown neurons. And there's a critical mass where your new behavior is the thicker pathway in your brain and your old behavior has been overwritten. And then it's like magic, your habits fall into place, these things you wanted come into your life, but it's not magic, it's all the hard work that you've done behind the scenes. And then the harmony piece is that two things, that it must be your head, you know, people say your head, heart and your gut, but that's your logic, your emotions and your intuition being aligned. So it can't be like logically, I think this is the career move that I should make, but in my heart, I don't really feel that. Um, or it can't be my intuition is telling me one thing, but I'm gonna do something else. And also that it you know, should be in harmony with other people. So you shouldn't focus on doing something if you know that it's gonna cause harm or be negative to other people. And the universal connection piece, and I think this really brings us full circle to the first thing that I said when you asked me about you know, what I've sort of learned or relied on this year is that our brains and our consciousness and our spirit and our integrity and you know our care and our belonging don't reside within us as islands. They reside within us as part of a group and a tribe and a species. And so, you know, when it's about the laws of attraction, it's really the fact that the more you give out in terms of gratitude and generosity and humility and trust, you get that back tenfold, a millionfold. Um, and so, you know, that's probably the biggest thing that I've learned in the last year is that the kinder and, you know, more grateful that I could be, the easier it felt to get through this year. And I'm, you know, I've been really honest with you as a friend that there were times where just doing the normal gratitude stuff that I would do was hard because it didn't feel like there was that much, you know, to be as grateful for as how easy it was before to be grateful for those things. Um, but, you know, that's neuroplasticity too. We have a number of questions. Here we go. How can you align this to teams and organizations? Great question. Wolfgang, I'm not even gonna answer that question because you clearly have to sign up for Neuroscience for Business because that's exactly what I did with that program aligned all of this stuff to teams and organizations. Yes, we will certainly send you more about the six week program. Um, I have a question for you is, what are you most looking forward to doing when the lockdown and the pandemic gets to a better state? Well, that's a no brainer for me. I, I've, been, I've been meditating on those two things for so long now, hugging all my friends and my stepson and traveling around the world. <laughs> And coming to Boston, particularly. We have a couple minutes for a couple questions, if there are more from the audience. I'd love to hear more from the audience. Okay. Okay, how can we change our old habits and adopt new ones? So through the lens of neuroplasticity, to wait, the way to think about that is that you can't unlearn habits that are already wired into your brain. You have to overwrite them with a new habit. And this kind of speaks to Wolfgang's question about how do we apply this to teams and organizations? Um, because one of my clients had an aha moment when I explained that. And he said, okay, so if someone in my team is doing something that I don't like, I shouldn't just say, can you not bring me documents in this way? I should say, please, could you do this instead? And, and I hadn't articulated it in that way, but I was like, yeah, that's exactly what you should be doing. And he just you know, felt that that was a game changer. So. Um, for yourself, it's like language use and disuse. If you grew up bilingual in English and Spanish, 
And maybe later you also learn Portuguese. And then you stop using the English so much. Let's say you move to Brazil, you don't, you know, you use the Portuguese much more than the English. The maps in your brain for those languages, they shift with use. So the more you use Portuguese, that map in your brain for Portuguese would grow and the map in your brain for English would shrink. And, you know, assuming that you were still using Spanish at home or, um, you know, on family Zoom calls and things, that would kind of stay the same. So um, on, in, neuro, in neuroscience of business, we go through case studies of all these amazing neuroplasticity stories. Like, I mean, these experiments that were done on monkeys with, that had their arms tied up and stuff, they, you know, that all got banned and, you know, started up the, started up the um, charity PETA. But we can still talk about the results that we got from that research. And then things like how a new father's brain changes when he, you know, first has, um, becomes a parent and how stroke rehabilitation works and how London cab drivers learn the knowledge and their brains change in a specific part that's to do with navigation and memory. Um, you can see I get very excited about neuroplasticity, but it's because you can overwrite old undesired habits with new desired habits. And for me, that is just a game changer for your whole life. Self-love. Can you speak to the importance of self-love? Yeah, it's such a beautiful question and so important. Um, you know, and I'm really aware that this year I've been asked by so many journalists to write about loneliness and it's brought it so much to the front of my, my mind more than ever that, you know, even if you lived alone before, you still went out and shook hands with eight people a day and had meetings and, you know, that's been taken away from people. So self-love is important whether you're alone or not because it's related to self-esteem and that's related to abundance. And so basically it's about taking care of yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And it could start with you asking yourself that question every morning. What do I need to do today to take care of myself physically? And, you know, I had trained myself and got to a really good place with my time restricted eating, but you know, what I know from my clients and patients and students is that loads of people skip meals because they're busy and they don't think that their own body and their brain is the most important thing that they should be focusing on. There's a huge difference between skipping meals and intentionally restricting the time within which you eat and, you know, doing intentional fasting. So, you know, sometimes I would think, okay, the thing I need to do today physically to look after myself is go to bed early or, you know, the thing I need to do today mentally to look after myself is take a proper break between meetings emotionally reach out to one of my friends and make sure I you know, stay in touch with them. That was a big one for me this year. I found that even though you know, seeing my friends is like something I'm so looking forward to, that a month could easily go by and I hadn't really reached out to people. And then you know, that started to get me really down. So folk realizing how important that is. And then spiritually, you know, what came up last year is there are several things that are laid down in our neural architecture when we're children. And they're things like our values, our roles, our boundaries, expectations, secrets, you know, what you don't talk about. The one that really surfaced last year was boundaries. And so feeling confined, feeling restricted, um, that, was, that was how it showed up for me, that I felt, you know, that I was not free. I wasn't free to travel. I wasn't free to see people. I wasn't free to, you know, even go to my own home in London. And so if you identify what's bothering you spiritually about your boundaries or your, you know, your role, because the, the role could also get very stretched in the household if you're trying to work and be a parent um, and be a partner. So trying to like unpick those things, they're all in the book as well. Um, and just working out what you need to do to, to show yourself care and attention. And one of the things that I do, it's, like a, it's a version of my gratitude list, is I write down 10 things I love about myself. Because we don't do that because we're not, you know, we don't really brag about ourselves. So when do you ever sit around and say, oh, the things I love most about myself are this and that. And I got my husband to do it too. And he's not really into spirituality at all. But if I give him a little task, he'll do it. And he said he felt, you know, he felt better after he did it. I, she also gave it, gave it to me as a task to do. And I did feel a little boost after doing it. And it's, you don't take time to celebrate 
you know, your, your strengths. Um, we have time for one last question. Hannah. <laughs> um, thank you for saying I'm a high achiever. I don't really think of myself like that because particularly in the home, I am not treated like a high achiever. So I'm, I think I'm very grounded by the people that are around me. Um, I would say that I probably was guilty of overthinking before, like just when I was younger. Or, or actually, maybe for me, it came a bit later because I trained as a physician and I worked as a physician for seven years. And there's a very clear um, hierarchy and there are very clear roles in that. So you don't, and you're, you know, you're very well trained and it's other people's lives. So you don't tend to overthink. When I changed career and I went from the top of the pile to the bottom of the pile, I, I'm sure I did a lot of overthinking then. Um, and yeah, in a way it helps you improve yourself, but I actually think it's a bit counterproductive. So I've definitely learned to, to not do it, to rely on my intuition much more, to go with the flow, um, but you know, but never be too proud to ask for help or advice. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you for all of your questions and making this a fun and interactive conversation. Thank you, Tara. It was a pleasure to spend time with you. Oh, thank you so much, Kristen. And yeah, it's so thrilling to see so many people here. And I really hope you're all doing okay. And if there's one thing that you do after this, please make a list of 10 things that you love about yourself. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Signing off. <laughs>